So friends, I have chosen um, the topic for this particular session as privacy protection through data protection. The idea of uh, choosing the topic like this is to ensure that the common, um, uh, you can say the problem which we in the technology field have about appreciating this uh, new legislation which is coming up called the Privacy uh, Protection uh, Act or presently what we can call as a uh, personal data protection bill uh, needs to be understood in the right uh, context. So that's why I thought we will discuss this theme of privacy protection through data uh, protection. I will be having this session for about 45 minutes. Uh, uh, so after about 30 minutes, we will have some question and answer uh, session. So this Personal Data Protection Act of India, in whatever name it is called, uh, is around the corner. We know that the draft is already in the public domain and it has assumed the status of what we call as reasonable security practice under section 43A of Information Technology Act or what we can call as due diligence under section 79 and 43A of Information Technology Act. Why I am referring to this Information Technology Act is that once this act, uh, act comes into operation, section 43A of Information Technology Act will be deleted, which is a clear indication that this entire Personal Data Protection Act is a replacement of Section 43A of the Information Technology Act, and it has to be seen as a seamless continuation of whatever data protection regulations are presently available in India as an interpretation of either Section 43A or Section 79 of Information Technology Act. What we call as reasonable security practice contained in the IDA 2000 will automatically become this personal data protection bill or the provisions contained therein uh, as a matter of prudence for any organization which wants to be compliant with the regulations without being perhaps goaded into by uh, some legislative or regulatory action. Now, PDPA, as we can call this, will definitely bring new and very disruptive compliance regime for all organizations who directly or indirectly handle personal data. Such companies may include companies like the social media companies, Facebook or Twitter. It will also include ISPs, mobile service providers, banks, fintech companies, and in fact, any online consumer facing companies, even manufacturing companies, which may hold the personal data of their customers, they will also be coming under the personal data protection regulations. In fact, large companies which are not perhaps handling much of public uh, personal data, but they're handling large uh, number of uh, employee personal data, they also need to look at this particular legislation uh, uh, with some kind of uh, uh, you can say interest. This legislation covers government departments, NGOs, trusts, uh, maybe even uh, partnership firms, proprietary concerns. In fact, even individuals who are collecting and processing personal data for the purpose of commercial uh, exploitation. What it perhaps will exclude is collection by an individual for personal use. The act has claimed some extra, you can say, importance because non-compliance of this act may result in imposition of hefty fines, which can go up to a maximum of 4% of the global turnover of a company. These fines under this act may be imposed for 
non compliance of any of these provisions of this act even when no data breach or cyber crime has actually occurred so that way this is slightly different from the information technology act which is more a cyber crime act and which can be invoked only if the um, uh, i mean a particular uh, incident uh, has a victim and the victim invokes it as a right under the information technology act so compared to the cyber crime legislations this compliance related legislations like this pdpa as well as the uh, let us say the uh, uh, gdpr they assume greater importance because even when there is no uh, i mean uh, data breach we may have to actually look at the compliance uh, requirement now another important aspect of this particular legislation is that there is going to be an exclusive authority called the data protection authority which will be monitoring the activities on a dedicated basis this was not happening when information technology act was there and this data protection authority will have a sort of a representative in each of these companies uh, who will be the data protection officer and this data protection authority will use inspectors who can conduct enquiries and and these are not simple simple inquiries these are investigative inquiries which the dpa can order and there will also be a system for adjudication which is a more legal process there will be an appellate tribunal supreme court all that for for that uh, uh, you can say determination of penalties under this particular legislation now we can expect that because of this legislation there will be a disruption beyond description in some parts of the industry see only those industries who were so far exposed to international laws like gdpr were perhaps familiar with what it means to be uh, i mean uh, com i mean com uh, complying with a legislation like a privacy protection legislation but now we will be having other industries who are at present uh, not uh, aware of the intricacies of such a uh, uh, compliance uh, also come into the ambit of this particular legislation okay so from now onwards the way business is structured in an organization may have to undergo a change even the management structure and the hierarchy may have to be tinkered with the operational powers of different types of professionals like the cso the cto the compliance officers the risk officers they will have to be aligned with the dpo when the dpo becomes one of the main uh, persons who will be responsible for data uh, protection in an organization so the mantra for all of us today is be aware of what is the law be ready with the compliance uh, requirements so that you can be compliant when it is required now just to give a sort of a bird's eye view of this uh, personal data protection act which uh, is spread over 14 chapters 98 sections we have one, one part of course definitions and applicability features then there are also certain exemptions which work along with the applicability and then we have what are called uh, the rights of the data protection and data principle we have got obligations of a data fiduciary then there is this compliance requirements which we call it as transparency and accountability in that particular chapter there are restrictions on transfer of personal data outside india covered in one particular chapter children's data is separately covered in a particular chapter there are penalties and offenses then about institutions like dpa and the appellate tribunal then certain miscellaneous provisions are covered in other uh, specific uh, uh, chapters 
Now, first of all, this act prescribes where the law is applicable, then goes into defining what are the obligations of the data fiduciaries and processors, then the rights of data principles. These penalties, mechanism of how the regulations will be rolled out, all these are contained in the act, in a manner in which an act can uh, handle it. In the sense that certain details will have to be rolled out in the regulations which will come later. We should not expect the act to be containing all the details of the procedures to be adopted and therefore we should look at the act which is in the current state as a bill as the top level uh, understanding of what the law is and we have to wait for more details to come before we pass any judgment on whether any provision is correct, incorrect or uh, whatever uh, is done. But there will be conflicts, there will be grey areas, not all of us will like all the provisions because a privacy law is inherently addressing a situation where it has to satisfy stakeholders who are privacy activists, stakeholders who are processors and stakeholders like the government. There are always conflicting interests of these stakeholders and therefore you cannot have a law which is acceptable to everybody without an objection. But if we want to respect the law, then we have to respect the objective for which the law is enacted. Otherwise, we will try to only look at the faults, not understanding why that fault is perhaps allowed to exist, whether there is no option other than letting it stay in the uh, particular legislation. For that reason only, I want to state that the main objective of PDPA is actually not data protection, though it is called a data protection legislation. The main objective is privacy protection. So unless we in the technology field understand that the uh, objective of uh, the particular law is for the purpose of uh, protecting the privacy, we will not be able to appreciate why the uh, law is designed in a particular manner. Now, if you look at the privacy law in India, we have to start with the Supreme Court judgment of 2017, Putaswami judgment, which defined privacy as a fundamental right under the Indian constitution and is part of the article 21. And under this article, it is considered a part of the right to dignified life and liberty. I am not uh, going into the history prior to this because all that is uh, passed and what remains now is the Supreme Court judgment. But this Supreme Court judgment has also stated that this right to privacy, though it's a fundamental right, is not an absolute right. It is subject to reasonable restrictions indicated under Article 19.2. This Article 19.2 of the Indian Constitution provides that the fundamental rights um, can be perhaps uh, overridden uh, through the operation of any existing law or new laws which can be made where in the interest of the sovereignty and integrity of India or security of state, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, decency, morality, even contempt of court, defamation and incitement of offense for any of these reasons, the fundamental rights can be uh, in a way overridden. This is part of the constitution itself. Now, having said that privacy is a fundamental right, subject to reasonable restrictions, Putaswami judgment did not actually find privacy in a proper manner. Therefore, the doubt of what is that we are going to protect remains still an enigma. But the judgment highlighted that uh, privacy protection extends to what we can call as information privacy in view of the importance of the digital way of life which we have all adopted. It indicated that the essence of protection is to give a choice to the individual to determine how his personal data 
can be shared with the society. The judgment recognized that individual possesses some information which if he wants, he can hold it confidential. If he wants, he can place it in the public domain or he can share conditionally and this conditional sharing is what translates into what we call as consent in the uh, regulation. Now, the management of this personal information is what is codified into the law of data protection. Now, the expert committee which was headed by Justice Sri Krishna had recommended a personal data protection version uh, which was called 2018 version. Uh, a modified version of this was presented in the current parliament in December 2019. That was called Personal Data Protection Bill 2019. This is the one which is now under consideration of the Joint Parliamentary Committee for finalization. Hopefully, without much of delay, this will become the uh, law which we may call as Personal Data Protection Act 2020 uh, when passed. I hope it will not be delayed beyond this year uh, because there is a commitment which the Government of India has given to the Supreme Court that such a law will be uh, passed. Now, PDPA is, as I told you, structured as a law for compliance, unlike ITA 2000, which was a law which was structured for providing punishment to cyber uh, crimes. Now, ITA 2000 defined certain norms of behavior and classified them as contraventions some of them as civil wrongs for which a victim who has suffered a wrongful loss could claim uh, compensation. It also stated certain contraventions, uh, classified them as criminal offenses for which imprisonment and fines would be provided. So this was meant to provide justice to the victims of any contravention of law. Now PDPA prescribes norms to prevent this kind of cyber crimes happening, so it restricts its activities to personal data. That is why this has got uh, some kind of a relation to 43A of Information Technology Act and 79, which were imposing certain responsibilities on certain body corporates or intermediaries for following a certain type of security procedures or due diligence so that crime does not happen. So, this PDPA is one such proactive legislation for the purpose of ensuring that cyber crimes probably don't happen at all, or if it happens, there is a kind of uh, proper regime for providing justice to the um, uh, affected uh, victims. Now, as far as the applicability of the act is concerned, the first point of applicability is that it applies to what we can call as personal data, which is data which is identifiable to a living person. The word living I have just added because the Act has not very clearly mentioned it, but when we are talking of protecting the privacy as a, for a person who is a citizen of the country, Obviously, we are talking of somebody who can exercise that right for which he has to be alive. So, we are not today considering that PDPA is applicable to the personal information of dead persons. We do not know whether the uh, law will be clarified a little later. But as of now, the protection under Personal Data Protection Act seizes on the death of a person. In fact, the so-called consent which we take for personal data, uh, if it happens to be considered as a contract, we know that under the Contract Act, the contract also terminates on the death of a person. Therefore, it is consistent to consider that PDPA exists only to protect the personal data of living persons. Now, Having said that, it applies to the... Act.
Pardon? Okay. Now, having said that this is applicable to a person's identifiable data, it does not obviously apply to something called anonymized data. And within that personal identifiable data, we have to look at the activity of processing in India or carrying on a business which is directed towards India as creating the liability of PDPA compliance. If any organization, even if it is abroad, is profiling the Indian citizens, then also PDPA will be applicable. So the person who is either processing or who is directing the processing, whom we can call as the data fiduciary, a term equivalent to data controller in other laws, this data fiduciary or data processor may or may not be present in India. They may or may not be individuals, they may be companies, they may be governments, they may be even foreign governments. They are all coming under this particular legislation if their activity involves processing of personal data of Indian citizens, particularly within the Indian um, uh, jurisdiction. Now, as far as the obligations are concerned, we have these eight obligations, which are uh, like the principles uh, of data protection, which are there in the uh, uh, GDPR. And one of which is law processing, law lawful processing. Second is purpose limitation, collection limitation, notice requirement, quality of data, retention restriction, accountability, and consent necessity. So these are the eight principles which we need to remember as obligations of a data fiduciary. And accountability includes all the um, requirements of uh, compliance. So similar to this, there is the four rights which are given to the uh, data principles. One is the right to confirmation and access that a certain data is being processed. Second is right to correction and erasure then right to data portability. Then beyond the right to correction and erasure, right to be forgotten permanently is also recognized as a right, but exercisable with some caution because right to be forgotten in the Indian law can be exercised only with the permission of the adjudicator. Other things which do not fall under the right to be forgotten, uh, can be handled under eraser, but the real right to be forgotten that is once and for all uh, uh, deleting all information related to a data principle is right to be forgotten. It has to be exercised only with the permission of the adjudicator. Now, as far as the penalties are concerned, we have this top world class category where the uh, penalties may extend up to 4% of the global turnover. Uh, or rupees 15 uh, crores. Second is the, what I have just called as a silver uh, class of uh, uh, penalties, which is applicable to certain uh, 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 contraventions for which 2% of the global turnover is what is uh, considered as the uh, liability or five crores. In the case of government, uh, there is no turnover limit. There is only five crore uh, limit. Then we have got other kinds of uh, penalties which are per day fines for not adhering to some kind of uh, uh, regulation, directions, or submission of returns, etc., which are all operational in nature. If not, and nothing of this is applicable for a particular contravention, there is also a residual uh, penalty. Even the residual penalty can go up to one cross, so therefore it cannot be uh, neglected. As far as the criminal offense is concerned, there is only one section which talks about uh, the criminality, that is re-identification of a de-identified information, knowingly and intentionally, 
and without the consent of whoever is uh, either the data principal himself or the data fiduciary who was the person responsible for the first de-identification. If X company has de-identified, if Y company is re-identifying, this Y company, if it doesn't have the consent of X company, it falls under this criminal uh, category of NFS. There will be three years imprisonment or two lakhs of fine, and this is non-bailable. However, this is cognizable only when the Data Protection Authority initiates the complaint, the police or a member of the public cannot on his own invoke this offensive uh, section. But what is important is when such an um, offense is uh, recognized, then it may extend to company executives for lack of due diligence or contributory so when you say company executives, it will be officials in charge of business as also the directors and uh, company secretaries, obviously the data protection officer, DPO. Okay. And in the case of governments, that vicarious liability can extend to the heads of government departments, though a government servant cannot be prosecuted without the sanction of certain designated authorities as is provided in the criminal procedure uh, code. Now, in terms of the compliance, we have got three dimensions of compliance for a company. One is towards the data protection authority. Next is towards the data principal and third is internal. To the data protection authority, one of the first compliance requirements for an organization is to get itself registered. See, those companies or organizations or data fiduciaries who will be called significant data fiduciaries, they will be requiring mandatory registration. This classification of somebody as a significant data fiduciary is discretionary in the sense it is not related to whether the company is actually processing a sensitive personal information or not. Depending upon the volume of the data, personal data being processed by a company, depending even on the financial turnover of the company, the sensitivity of personal uh, data or any other uh, conditions like harm which may be caused, the data protection authority has a right to designate a class of activities as the significant data fiduciaries. And once the, an organ, I mean, a particular type of activity is designated as a significant data fiduciary activity. We need to identify whether we are in that business. If so, we have to get it, get registered. If we don't get registered, it will be a violation for which 2% uh, um, penalty in terms of financial administrative penalty can be uh, fixed. Similarly, registration will be required for Organizations which will be processing minus data, they will be called guardian fiduciaries. There will also be some people called social media intermediaries who will be notified by the government. Again, the notification may not identify an individual company. It may only speak about a type of activity. So therefore, we have to watch out for the regulations of the BPA. And if we come under the registration formalities, we have to get it registered. Once we are registering, at the time of registering, we have to actually provide what is called a privacy by design policy. This is like a prospectus in an IPO kind of a situation. The company has to commit itself to what it is doing with the personal data and submit a copy to the data protection authority and ensure that they follow it up subsequently. There are also restrictions on transfer. Presently, restrictions, uh, restrictions on transfer of personal data apply only to sensitive personal information, critical personal information. Critical personal information cannot be transferred out of India. At present, we do not know which are the kinds of personal information which will be declared as critical. Sensitive personal information, there is a class of uh, information which has been notified in the uh, act itself. But sensitive personal information can also be transferred out of India, provided one copy is kept in India, and you have the consent of the data principle. As far as the non-sensitive personal information is concerned, at present there are no restrictions. The data fiduciaries also need to perhaps 
do some age verification and obtain parental consent in case of minors which also means that they should have a means of identifying whether a data principle is a minor or not this will be more relevant for companies which actually direct their services itself to the minors like uh, say byju or some such organization data breach notification is also a responsibility uh, to the dpa now to the data principle the main uh, responsibility is to have to obtain informed consent before a processing is uh, done of a personal data that depends on both the notice and obtaining the consent internally the organization in order to be compliant need to also organize what we call as data audits uh, data audits are mandatory on an annual basis from a third party but within a year the designated data protection officer will have to conduct data audits this designation of a dpo is mandatory for a significant data fiduciary and one of the requirements is the dpo should be located in india so that is applicable for mncs now apart from these compliance obligations while looking at it we must know that there are certain exemptions for example exemptions have been provided to government which follow what is the reasonable restrictions indicated in article 192 for any fundamental right um, second exemptions are provided from obtaining consent in certain instances of processing which may be applicable both to government and to private sector exemptions are also provided to small entities undertaking manual processing individuals for domestic purposes processors of personal data owners which means those kind of things they can be exempted by notification then if some processor is testing the technology there is a provision called sandbox scheme under which exemptions can be given for a limited period of 3 years therefore there is some exemptions available in addition to the overall exemptions some limited exemptions such as ex excluding lawful purpose and security If excluding these two rest of the provisions can be accepted for law enforcement purposes enforcing a legal right Uh, of a company, then processing by a uh, court, then a journalistic purpose, research, uh, etc. So these are what some of the exemptions. These exemptions have been a matter of uh, criticism by many privacy activists, uh, including, of course, uh, uh, Justice Sri Krishna himself. So I would like to reproduce that particular section 35, on which so many people are having objections. remember this is a very very limited exemption which the government has taken it applies only in the when a particular exemption is required necessary and expedient in the interest of sovereignty integrity of india in the interest of security of the state in the interest of friendly relations for preventing incitement to the commission of any cognizable offence relating to again sovereignty integrity etc so it is not a blanket permission to the government as many people uh, tend to mislead the masses this is a very specific provision uh, only to uh, to what is partially available in the uh, article 19 uh, 2 even in such cases the government will have to order for reasons to be recorded in writing and there has to be a procedure for which if it is misused it can come into some kind of a uh, um, uh, review now exemption from consent alone is available for certain purposes as i told you law enforcement courts medical emergency then in the employment situation for recruitment or termination for provision of services to the employee or the benefits verification of attendance assessment of performance these are all coming under exemption so there is a reasonable level of freedom to the company to handle its employees data in addition private sector can make note that exemption from consent is available for reasonable purposes which may be legitimate interest of the company prevention of any unlawful activity like fraud which means fraud detection requirements whistle blowing mergers network or information security credit scoring debt recovery 
then operation of search engines, processing of publicly available personal data. These are some of the exemptions which are available. Though we say that even when you make use of a publicly available personal data, it is preferable to take the consent before entering into the next stage of uh, uh, processing. Then exemption is available to BPOs as I told you. If you are processing information which is entirely non-Indian citizens, then better get this exemption uh, by way of a notification. Then you will be, that division will be exempt from the provisions of PDPA. Sandbox scheme is a special scheme. You have to apply to the PDPA as a project and based on that project, the, uh, it, you know, the exemption can be given for one year, extendable to two terms of one, one year each, so totally three years. So considering all these things, the road to compliance for companies includes understanding of the law and implementation with in good faith. Okay, understand the exemptions and if it is applicable to you, build a business structure which can still grow despite being compliant. Growth with compliance is the goal of any prudent CEO. So the key to be compliant and also take care of the legitimate interests of the organizations is the responsibility of the data protection officer. Now this data protection officer has a very complicated role. He is appointed by the board. So in a way indirectly he is reporting to the CEO for administrative purposes. But he is relating himself, his activities to an external authority called the DPA, external authority of, called inquiry officer, adjudicator, maybe even to the appellate tribunal. He is also a single point contact for data principle for grievance management. He is also expected to manage the internal relationship with the IT department, business department, etc. So this is the complicated role of the BPO, which requires definitely certain skills which are technical, legal and even managerial. He will definitely wield enormous powers but equally hazardous responsibilities. He has to be therefore a senior person reporting perhaps directly to the board. Because of this, if other professionals do not upskill themselves to occupy the role of DPO, they may lose lucrative opportunities for professional growth. That's why I keep on saying, be ready by being aware and by acquiring the necessary skills. We at FDPPI, Foundation of Data Protection Professionals in India, are trying to contribute to the development of this expertise through a massive uh, certification program, out of which a five module program, out of which only one module is presently available, two batches are uh, completed. Maybe in future we will have third uh, batch of this and then we will also roll out other batches. This is one way of acquiring the expertise. So I would like every one of you to look at how you acquire this expertise either by going through the material, the reading material which is available now, which will get announced when the DPA comes into operation and rules and regulations start rolling out. Right now we only have the act to contend with 98 sections. You can even buy it if you want. But what will happen is once there is a rollout of regulations, this law will keep on expanding. I will uh, stop here and if there are any questions, kindly uh, unmute yourself and raise the questions uh, so that I will be able to uh, address it. Sir, this is Ajay. Uh, I have a question when you spoke about uh, uh, having the personal uh, this law applicable only to the individuals do we consider uh, organizations and establishments or also as individuals under no, I did uh, not the legal it's available only to individuals exemptions uh, for by individuals processing for domestic purpose is exempt but uh, no, no, if you are talking of the personal data belonging to individuals yes it is only to individuals okay so data does not come under the privacy law Okay, sure. Sir. Thank you. The corporate information privacy comes under the Cyber Crime Law, Information Technology Act. So that is still there under Section 43A and 79, as you mentioned. No, not 43A. It will re remain under 43, 66, and other sections. 43A alone, which uh, was 
for reasonable security practices to be maintained for protection of sensitive personal information uh, has been uh, will be replaced with this PDP. All right. Sure, sir. Thank you. Yeah. See, this is the difference between information security and data security. An information security professional will try to protect the corporate data, which is uh, the business data, financial data, HR data of a company. Here, PDPA only protects the personal data. So perhaps part of the HR data, which is employees' data, will come under PDPA. The rest of the person, I mean, uh, data protection does not come under PDPA. It remains in the cybercrime law. Okay? Sure, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, you, you mentioned that this is applicable only to live persons, not the dead ones. Yeah. Uh, can the data of dead people be inherited by their legal heirs, and then that this becomes applicable as their property? See, whether data is a property or not is not a settled law. It is treated as a property. Um, so probably it can be inherited, particularly if the data has a value. But um, privacy is, is an individual right given to the data owner. Whereas the inheritor may be, he is not contending with his personal data. His personal data will be coming in the personal data um, act. Whereas somebody else's personal data, which he inherits as a property, it does not come under this law. It may come under property law. <clears throat> it's an intangible property, perhaps. I am Vijay Kumar Verma. Yeah. But I have understood that this Personal Data Protection Act is only for private individuals. I am finding that all big companies are appointing data protection officers. And yeah. we have also just seen some structure, what kind of a data protection officer role will be there. Now, what these will be protecting. Suppose a company is there whose data protection officer is already placed there. Then let us say that company is a bank. Yeah. Now bank has customer's data, which you said is not maybe part of privacy law. So what I have understood from it your talk is that privacy law. It is it is part of privacy law. Customer data is part of privacy law. Responsibility to protect it belongs to the bank. Okay, bank is presently working under the RBI. Uh, regulations, it will also have to work under the DPS regulations. So the data protection officer will protect this customer's data. Yes. Apart from that, the employee's data will also come under the purview of data protection officer. Right, sir? Agreed. Agreed. Yes. That's all, sir. Thank yes. you. Uh, sir, what is the eligibility criteria to become a data protection officer? Uh, because you know people with a technical background or if they are really interested uh, i mean like you know is it possible to move from technical industry to uh, uh, data protection or maybe like you know any legal degree is must sir uh, certainly this is a techno legal responsibility you need to know the law but you also need to know technology because this data protection officer is supposed to monitor all the active technical activities of an organization including Preparation of what we call as a data protection impact assessment report. Get it approved by the uh, DPA. So if your company is an artificial intelligence company or a big data company, this DPO will have to understand the technology and take that process to the DPA who may or may not be technically very, very uh, I mean, very informed, we do not know. But he should be able to satisfy him. Tomorrow, if there is a need to go to an adjudicator or an appellate tribunal where a judicial authority is sitting there, you should be able to explain the technical consequences. And he may even have to tell the IT people that whatever they are planning as the AI algorithm cannot be used. It has to be first because it does not satisfy the data protection law. So to have that kind of command over IT, he needs to know IT also. So he is a techno legal person, and in addition, he should have managerial skills, according to me. So technology people can move into it, 
and legal people corporate councils can also move into it it all depends on how they acquire cross functional skills sounds good thanks sir sir uh, this is anirudh here uh, going back to your question on uh, the bank right yeah now uh, two parts to that question sir one is uh, and this both relate to the banks which are present across countries so for banks say a bank in europe which has operations in india is the pdp applicable that is question number 1 question number 2 is vice versa an indian bank which has operations abroad and is the pdp applicable to those banks to the to the overseas branch See, as far as process in the data of indian citizens processed in india there is absolutely no doubt that it is applicable so the foreign bank uh, by processing indian data it is applicable the indian companies if they are registered in any indian law they are declared as coming under pdpa so therefore this indian bank processing for in like uh, foreigners data in addition to indian data is also coming under this particular uh, regulation the exemption which i told you for bpos may not be applicable to this banks the bpo exemption is applicable only when there is a, a contractual arrangement under which an indian processor is processing the data of exclusively foreign citizens they can segregate that data and uh, create a division and try to get the notification from the um, uh, dpa that that particular division is exempt this exemption at present doesn't seem to be available to indian company which is processing personal data anywhere in the world therefore indian banks which are registered in india will have to follow pdpa for all kinds of Uh, personal data they are handling there may be a overlapping of something i do not know that uh, will have to be uh, managed that is a gdpr law it may also be applicable to the foreign branch and at the same time the indian company also may be uh, may indian law also may be applicable navi samir here i also want yeah. to ask a question yeah live thing hello so currently what happens in large enterprises with a couple of thousand uh, email users all on the corporate platform uh, there is no specific law in terms of uh, the uh, c level or the head of it in terms of engaging uh, and 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 accessing the emails of all the employees in, in case they feel that some kind of threat is there to the organization does the pdpa hand, law handle this situation of employer or uh, uh, anybody uh, having getting access to and reading the uh, employee mail in case some kind of suspicion is there does it handle it anywhere actually this is a simple process okay uh, handles uh, this to some extent because it includes prevention and detection of fraud and network and information security so you yes. can consider that it is a legitimate interest of an organization to monitor the emails of their employees for then even without their consent you may have the right but you yeah. have to bring it very much under this justification of information security legitimate interest prevention and detection of unlawful activity so supposing i am now yeah. so supposing my company is doing a large deal for which only 10 people out of 5000 are are involved right so my question to you is that now i want to see that out of those 10 pe people i have authorized to to use this uh, to to get involved in the deal 11th person is not allowed but i want to check emails of all 5000 people whether any unlawful person is is actually uh, discussing that particular issue so there are ai tools involved which are actually reading the emails and finding out that supposing the word is crucial word is let's say xyz so so does uh, if i if i scan through 5000 mails if i put some tool there to scan through all 5000 mails and see those that xyz issue is being discussed only by 10 person whom i have given authority to and not the 11th person and if i do that is it is it 
are lawful under PDPA or not? Say, uh, the act cannot address such granular level details of action to be taken. We have to interpret from what is available in the act. Okay. Perhaps wait for uh, the procedures. But what you have in terms of these employees, you also have the option of actually getting his permission by a consent when you assign him to a particular project and thereby get explicit consent for certain things. Now, okay. beyond that, what you already have in the act is legitimate interest, prevention of uh, fraud, network and information security. If you define that confidentiality of this deal is part of the information security, it is for you to ensure that it is properly written down in the documents so that if tomorrow okay. there is a question, you will be able okay. to justify. Okay, all right. So all right. in this Thanks. case, uh, the same case, uh, isn't this, uh, won't this be covered under corporate policies? And since this, since this is not personal data. No, say corporate policy covers personal data in its hand, employee data in its hand, as well as non-personal data. Whereas we are today discussing personal data of customers and the uh, uh, employees, employees, which come under specific permission or exemption under this act. So this is within the overall uh, responsibilities of a company. Okay, sir. I'm Kodun Brown. Can I go ahead? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. See, we are talking about the jurisdiction. Normally, in any act, we will see that it is applicable to whole of India. Such a thing is not appearing here, number one. Secondly, when we talk about the persons... No, it is appearing and this Kashmir has been omitted because this came after section or article 370. Yeah. Go ahead. I don't think personal means he must be an Indian or a foreigner residing in India. For both of them that is applicable or only to citizens of India like RTI Act. This is applicable for processing of personal data in India and therefore it is applicable even to the foreigners whose data is being processed in India. Though the fundamental objective of the law is to protect Indian citizens because they have defined the applicability based on the activity happening within the geographical boundaries. If that activity has foreigners process, then unless they are exempted, like I told you under section 37, uh, this BPOs, it comes under the act. This is Amit Mathur. I have one question. Now, every sector regulator uh, has certain guidelines. Now, which will prevail? Whether DPA will prevail or the sector regulator guidelines will prevail? How is government thinking about handling that issue? The responsibility of the DPA to coordinate his policies with the sectoral regulators. That is what is stated. So, it uh, is left to the DPA to work out an arrangement with the sectoral uh, regulators like RBA and others who are well established and very powerful. Um, but when it comes to the personal data, the final say may be with the DPA. Okay, thanks. We feel that there will be no conflicts. People will understand each other and go ahead. <clears throat> but in Navi, as far as I understand, answering Amit's question, uh, in case of any dispute, DPA's uh, 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 ruling will take over or will kind of uh, uh, overrule, let's say, TRI and SEBI and RBIs. Am I right? I think so. That is, if it is related to personal data, yes, the rights and responsibilities which are there in this particular act. So on paper, at least DPA sounds more powerful in case of yes. privacy uh, of the individual compared to a TRI or a SEBI or a RBI yes, or a IRDA or even IRDA, IRDA. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But all are, say, responsible uh, authorities. They should not fight amongst themselves. And if such fight emerges, then there is Supreme Court to be, <laughs> or there is somebody to... That, that, is our, that is our wish that they should not fight. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, Anirudh again, uh, is this legitimate interest defined uh, anywhere in the act? No. Okay. Okay, because the question was, you know, in terms of, you know, we typically all consumers give uh, 
personal data for various reasons, you know, typically mobile number and uh, name, at least, if, if nothing. So how does one prevent uh, that? So it is under the principles that only minimal data has to be collected and it has to be retained only for a specified period. It has to be purpose oriented. So these are contained in the data protection principles or obligations. So collecting beyond that is not permitted under the act. So the interest of the uh, legitimate interest of the organization cannot override the data protection principles as well as the rights. Where it can be used is when getting a consent, uh, whether it should be explicit consent, if so, how it has to be obtained. There some minor procedural uh, requirement, you can try to invoke the legitimate interest because there are certain cases where it says if disproportionate effort is required for doing a particular thing, exemption can be claimed. So in such cases, legitimate interest can be used very, very cautiously. It cannot be used for doing anything they want. In fact, remember the word data fiduciary is different from the word data controller. The data fiduciary uses the consent like a contract, but being a fiduciary, he has a trustee kind of relationship with the data principal and therefore it is his duty to protect the interest of the data principal, even if the data principal himself doesn't know how to protect his interest. So when you offer him a uh, privacy policy on which he can click I accept, don't go by the impression that just because he has given the consent, you can do, do whatever you want. You can take permissions for 100 things where only two things are required. That is not acceptable under the Indian law where the data fiduciary becomes a trustee and it is his responsibility to tell the data principal, you are giving this permission. Are you aware of what are the implications of this? I would like to tell you that as a trustee, this is what I am going to do with this uh, particular thing. If you don't understand, please get it clarified. Now itself before giving the permission, that kind of a fiduciary relationship is envisaged in the Indian Act that will try to protect the interest of Indian data principles. Some of them are less educated, language issues are there, etc. Amit Mathur, this I just wanted to add, uh, if you read through the law, it says that when you are taking the consent, you are provide, you are supposed to give a notice to the data principal. In yeah, that yeah. notice, you are supposed to give him the purposes for which the data has been collected. Right. In that you will also have to specify what are the legitimate interests which you are trying to protect for yourself. Correct. Correct. Even there, I am saying that if it is not easily understandable, it is your responsibility to make it understood. Okay, in fact, this notice should also contain what is called a DTS, no? Data Trust Score, which is what the data auditor will give to the particular company uh, as an indicator of their compliance. So, person may not understand what is DTS, but you say your DTS is so and so. Now, if the customer asks what is this DTS, what does it mean, then you have to perhaps explain it. So, there is a sort of additional responsibility to the Indian data fiduciaries beyond what is envisaged as a data controller in other laws. That's all I would like to say. That is, all responsibilities of the data controller will be there, plus something more which we can imply and fight in a court of law. If a person, if a data principal wants, she can go to the Supreme Court and say, this I expected to be the responsibility of the fiduciary to tell me that what it means, and he failed to do that. So there, the court may take a view in favor of the data principle. This risk is there for data fiduciaries. We should not take things for granted. We should be erring on the safer side if it is necessary. Uh, Navi sir, Suresh here. Yeah, Suresh, yeah. Uh, just wanted to add a little bit of uh, this thing. I think, you know, Samir, mm -hmm. I think Samir Mathur's question, like, you know, when he was actually saying, that there could be some uh, mailbox monitoring or something, right? Is it uh, Samir? Was it Samir? Yeah, 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 tell me. Hmm. Yes, uh, Samir, like uh, this is Suresh. So, you know, before I actually implement those in intrusive monitoring, email monitoring system, so ideally one should actually obtain a consent or something from all the, you know, the employees. 
So at least let them know that like this is going to be I mean happening and uh, there is a possibility that their you know email box could be monitored, right? So unless you do that, so probably you know I think it would be a bad idea to you know kind of without actually notification to the end uh, you know, subject or the data principal in India. So it would be a bad idea to you know uh, without uh, uh, let them know about this uh, activity, right? Yes, Suresh, so that is one you know prevention of yeah. So my okay. point was, Suresh, yeah, thank, thanks for coming back to that point. So my point was that there are tools available which actually do not read the email. So, so like I said, that I just want to know that beyond those 10 points out of 5,000 employees in my company, I do not want anybody to know about this XYZ deal happening. So I put a, a, some kind of a crawler which is AI based and I look for, I check for all emails without reading the actual email where I say that who else is discussing about this XYZ deal because out of after those 10 guys, 11th guy is not supposed to know about this. So it's not a reading per se. So it's not intrusion in the right manner, but through an AI tool, I'm not reading the mail. I am throwing only going through metadata and, 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 and uh, 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 trying to find out whether this is being discussed. So my question to Navi was whether this gets covered under this PDPA and if it does, then what is the solution for this? Yeah. Now we're Vishwanath here. Can I, can I just pitch in here? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, please. Please go ahead, Vishwanath. Yeah. Uh, of course, I hope others, are, others don't mind extending this session, but uh, please go ahead. Okay, see, in this particular case, okay, see, I mean, any, many of the DLP tools does it, you know, I mean, the, uh, you have uh, DLP tools and uh, they search for keywords and if it, uh, you know, if something objectionable comes up, Anyway, that will trigger and all the uh, process starts. Yes. It, however, in this particular case, what you just mentioned, where uh, you know, a few of them will be working on a deal and you want to monitor uh, 5,000 email boxes. See, this is, covered, uh, this is covered as a part of the contract between employee and employers, empl employer and employees. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, see, um, you know, one notification probably, you know, uh, where the employees will consent that that, that uh, their uh, the key logging or the emails can be monitored, and that has to be stored in a play, anywhere. You know, later on, if if it has to be shown to say anybody, it should be stored. So that consent is extremely important in this case, and the the employee should be aware that their email is being monitored. I mean, it can, it can be live monitoring by I mean, eyeball monitoring, or it can be using DLP. But employees should be made aware that their email boxes are being checked by the employer. Okay. 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 So, I mean, if it is not done, then certainly, uh, you know, employee can go and uh, uh, sue the employer under DPA. So, uh, but uh, I'm sorry, this is Ajay here. One question though, when you are in a company and when you're using the company resource, the data generated there is property of the company and not the individual. Is my understanding incorrect? No, the under that understanding is correct. However, you know, for reasonable uh, purposes, you know, personal, uh, uh, you know, uh, the company resources can be used for uh, personal purposes as well. Okay, so mm -hmm. it, it is not the entirely company's property. Uh, it, however, it is important to inform the employees that their email is being monitored by the organization. In your corporate email policy, please make this clear that yeah. you're using the corporate email or its resources, they are dealing with the corporate resources and anything generated, created, there belongs to the company. Okay, and make people understand this. If they want to do private uh, uh, conversation with the official ID, let them do it in a separate ID. Otherwise, if they misuse the facility, vicarious liabilities under Information Technology Act will apply to the company. So we don't want to do that. So please ensure that this is part of the corporate email policy. So Navi Samir again here. My question was that only that I know that uh, the the email data uh, is owned by the company, not by the individual. But my question was that with now, with this PDP coming in, yeah. with this PDP coming in, still the employee data privacy uh, remains uh, is not an issue. You are saying still the data is completely no. owned by the company. You are given the provision of taking an explicit consent uh, by taking uh, an employee policy. And then okay. I told you this uh, two or three exceptions. Okay. Okay. Use all that. 
But okay. when the PDPA comes, please rewrite your employees' policies. Yes, you yes, yes. Refresh it and so that people will not say that you never uh, told me about new provisions or something okay, like that. Okay. okay, fair enough. No, thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay. Sir, one more small thing. Yeah. I'm Vijay again. Yeah. Is it a cyber crime also? Violation of Data Protection Act. It will be. And what is the redressal? Yeah. Suppose somebody has to go to a local police station or cyber crime cell or where? I say PDPA will address the compliance related issues. Okay. Though the data principle has a right to go to the adjudicator of PDPA and claim personal relief, the relief which he can claim from the ITA adjudicator or the criminal action which can be taken under ITA have not been specifically barred. So, of course, uh, there should be no double jeopardy. So, same thing, you will not go to the adjudicator here as well as the adjudicator in uh, ITA. Um, so, one of those forums you will have to choose. Then, as far as the criminal things are concerned, you may have to go to ITA 2000 because PDPA has only one section that is only for re-identification. So, in any specific incident of data breach, there may be application of PDPA provisions as well as the yes. ITA uh, provisions. But most of the PDPA provisions will come from the DPA, except when the data principal claims a relief personally. Rest of the times, the penalties of PDPA comes with the action from the DPA. Whereas under ITA 2000, the victim of a cyber crime will either file a police complaint or will go to the IT adjudicator and claim compensation. So that is what it appears to stand as of today. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. So there's just one. Uh, see, there are few I emails. For, see, see, there are few emails. For example, it, the salary slip. Uh, just a second, sir. I'll just clarify on this email thing. Oh, Kodanda. Hello? Go ahead, go ahead, Vishnu. See, for example, you know, the, the salary slip or the pay slip, okay, that is generated by the organization and comes through a corporate email. Okay, so it, it is my personal data as well. It's just not the company's uh, data and it cannot be shared with everybody. I mean, yeah, you so, can so, assign your personal property to the com company. Yeah, so so yeah. not everything what is generated by the organization is a company's property. There are some personal data as well. So it is all between the, the contract between the employee and the employer. Okay. That's what I wanted to say. That's why I want employees, employees yeah. to rewrite their contract, make it very specific. That Correct. This is the situation. So that at Correct. least that people are aware of it. Okay, beyond these quotes are there whether it is reasonable or unreasonable. Okay, that is different. Correct. Correct. But on paper, from compliance angle, have a policy in place. Correct. Okay. I agree with you. Abhijit? Um, sir, I've already typed the question there. When is PDP applicable to captive operations of foreign banks? I mean, it's, it's basically not a third party which is processing the data in India. It is the bank's employees uh, who are processing it in India. Now it can be local, uh, it can be Indian data as well, as well as the overseas. Um, so will that, uh, I, I know you had covered it, un, uh, you had covered a part under uh, the exemption for BPOs, but you, you had mentioned that it would be third parties. No, it, this, is, uh, this doesn't come under BPO because here you are talking of the, the personal data of Indian citizens processed within India. Whereas that BPO exemption is for processing of foreigners data in India under a contract from a foreign data fiduciary. But then I mean, if both the data are being processed at the same place, then... You have to create that distinction, create separate infrastructure, like uh, we say as a hybrid entity and uh, have arm's length relationship between the two work groups, all those things we, you need to do. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So there's a scenario which I wanted to discuss. For instance, uh, let's say there's a website and it has a form on it which can, which asks for certain personal data. 
the host of the website may be, say let's say it resides in the, in the Netherlands and the, the servers are let's say in the USA and the data and the data and the data principle here is probably says from India now who is supposed to take uh, you know uh, what is the scenario here like I would like to understand the scenario say there is the data principle there is the hosting uh, company which may be a purely technical company and there is a owner of that particular hosting facility who is doing the business with this personal data am i correct uh, i meant the owner of the business uh, it's a business which has a website uh, the owner of the business is in netherlands the okay. website's host is in us and it's, let's okay. say in usa okay. and the data principal is residing in india from uh, for, from whom the owner is collecting data so indian uh, uh, data principal the company which you are talking of is definitely a data fiduciary now the question of the hosting company alone is re remains to be settled okay now if this hosting company has access to this personal data it will become a sort of a processor under the contract of the data fiduciary say giving space for hosting is a where that is where the hosting company offers the space to the um, uh, company which you are talking of but if this company offers access then it's a reverse contract to the hosting company which they should not do for example if it is entirely encrypted data and the encryption key is not available to the hosting company then the entire right is with the uh, domain owner only so in that case this uh, hosting company has got no role because they are only handling encrypted data doesn't it deal with the transient storage of data it is not specifically dealt with here okay that is the intermediary status under the information technology act but if they have access to this data in admin access kind of a thing then it should be considered as they are I, like you call as joint controllers elsewhere you can call them as core data fiduciaries mm -hmm. but if they do not want to be called core data fiduciaries because they don't they do not determine the means of processing etc they can take the role of a subcontractor of this data fiduciary and that contract will have to specify exactly what is the role today's domain hosting contracts do not cover this particular aspect so they have to be looked at once again on the fact that a owns the hard disk on which i allow you to make use of certain space that is one contract then b who uses that allows administrative access to a that is a second contract that contract should have this data protection uh, kind of regulations if he does not give like in all cloud transactions if the data is entirely encrypted and the cloud service provider doesn't have a, any possibility of reading that data without decryption then he is actually in a better position his responsibility is much less but if you are hosting plain text in a cloud data you are unnecessarily making that host company more responsible than they should they want to be as an intermediary so in your contracting this has to be taken into account contracting for hosting space is different from contracting for handling of the data that is my current view yeah, everything else we have to look at context basis uh, usually so what Kodan, sorry go ahead hello uh Kodan, yeah. can i go ahead sir yeah See, I have. I want to know from a layman's point of view, what is this anonymization as defined in Section 3.2, and when it is applied to 2B, how it is to be understood? I am unable to understand from a layman point of view because I am not technical man. No, no. Anonymization is a personal data, but you cannot find out whose data it is. That is, when the personal data first originates. It has got the data plus the identity to whom this relates to. If you kill that identity parameters irreversibly, in the sense that 
even if you try, you cannot re-identify, then that is called anonymized data. If you only remove it, keep it elsewhere, that is called de-identified data. That is, there is a data, let us say, there is a health report of myself. It comes with the name Vijay Shankar Health Report. Okay, now this name, maybe in you know, some number, PAN card number, etc., which are associated with this data, if I remove it, it becomes first the de-identified information. Then this identity parameters, if it is forensically deleted from the custody of this person, then tomorrow if you ask me whose data is it, I am not able to find out, then it becomes anonymized data. Anonymized data is outside the purview of PDPA, it can even be shared outside, you can put it on the website. But remember, when I talk of medical data, sometimes some data can never be anonymized. For example, if you have got a skull x-ray, you can never anonymize it, say iris scan, it's a biometric, okay, tooth scan. So there are certain kinds of information which can never be anonymized, but there may be something else. For example, there's a train ticket, okay, there is somebody traveled in the train on such and such a day, seat number so and so. Now it is associated with uh, the name of the person, passenger. If you remove that, you can call that as a de-identified data, something like that, okay? Thank this, you, sir. I understood very well. Yeah. I'm proud of you. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs>